imperishable in bronze and stone, the timeless great look out over a city. A city revisited, sights and sounds distilled into impressions. There is a drive in the air. Is it the drive that made the city or the city that makes the drive? Anonymous conurbation, this, but Liverpool, vital city and port. On the northwest's Mersey, 43 square miles of teeming life, vibrant, colourful, resilient and diverse. A city of nearly three quarters of a million people. A city at once ancient and yet coursing with a youthful energy. Has this Liverpool sprung from its people or have the people sprung from Liverpool? What is there in the Northwest to create this exciting atmosphere? The drive is from the spirited leadership of the people of this great city, a Celtic city, a European city. These are the people proud of their history but concerned about their future. More jobs, new homes, new schools, creating the good life, reaching always towards the future. And springing from this spirit, the region's popular music reflects the energy of Merseyside and of the people who work hard and play hard. The city is old. Its site goes back to before the Normans. But by the start of the 13th century, Liverpool had become a focus. King John granted a charter and its role as a port had become defined. During the next 450 years, it remained small and of little importance, but the potential was always there in the Mersey and in the people. By 1715, encouraged by growing trade, Liverpool took the significant step of building the first enclosed dock in Britain. This was the start of Liverpool's first golden age. With developing trade, new industries and commerce came to the city, spreading out from the tight cluster of shipping offices round the old docks. On this mounting wave of prosperity, the city set about a great expansion of the docks to take new ships like the Great Eastern, as steam took over from sail. Inland, the coming of the railways and metal roads radiated out to coal mines, foundries and the mills of the north. Liverpool had become a powerful city, but a city centred on maritime trade. This was, then, its strength and its weakness. Industrial and social change was already in the air by the outbreak of the First World War. For the next four years, Liverpool was kept at full stretch with a volume of trade greater than anything known before, until the armistice. While the people celebrated peace, the clouds of depression were looming as international trade perished and Merseyside suffered more than most. But the city held on and planned for the future, with new work and new homes for its people. The die was cast in 1936 when the city made another far-sighted decision which was again to bring prosperity to the Mersey. At that time, the government was unable to help, so the city itself raised many hundreds of thousands of pounds to provide land for new industries, to finance new factories and mastermind a new industrial revolution. Never again were Liverpool's eggs all to be in one basket. The first project was at Speak, on the southeast of the city. In the early 1930s, it was a lonely hamlet. Now it is a thriving community. Speak, the first example of civic action to pump new life into an ailing society. In the years which followed, it set the pattern for other communities to be developed at Aintree and Kirby. New industries of every complexion were attracted to the vigorous bustle of a city which never had time to pity itself.
Here on the eastern boundary, for example, is one of the largest factories in Europe. The Ford Motor Company invested 50 million pounds in this 350 acre plant. It's the biggest capital investment on Merseyside and 12,000 people work here. The plant is capable of producing 1,500 new cars a day. Cars for the world, produced on the doorstep of the docks. Before making this investment, the Ford Motor Company investigated other sites in Britain in great depth, but finally chose Liverpool with its excellent communications and available labour force. Other cars, too, roll off busy production lines. But these are made by Meccano, old-time residents who have kept pace with the changing taste of children everywhere. Dinky toys are exported by the million. They've won success with the meticulous detail and scale of their models and careful hand painting to give the authentic finishing touches. The same firm's construction or toy has shaped the careers of goodness knows how many of today's engineers. First produced in an unpainted natural steel, then in blue and gold, then in red and green, and now gay in space-aged colours. And even these colours could come from Liverpool. This world-famous paint company runs an advice bureau to exploit the advantages of modern paints and colours, to make low rooms seem higher, narrow rooms seem wider, cold rooms warmer, all by the cunning use of colour, contrast and texture. And these high-speed machines knit nylon stockings from white yarn. They'll be dyed in batches later to the colour dictates of fashion. From the new factories of Liverpool come many other types of synthetics. Resins for drip-dry shirts, grass fibres and plastics for almost everything. Excellent as the Liverpool climate is, uh, there are as yet no orange groves. But that's no problem for a city with Liverpool's communications. Industries like this have brought a thriving, diverse and expanding industrial community. The city is host to hundreds of firms whose activities range over the whole spectrum of British business, from timber to matches and furniture. Jams, biscuits and cheeses, every sort of food processing, where, just as at shh, you know where, automation and good mechanical handling means that people's work is used productively to satisfy the wants of the world and his wife.
And what women want is to cut the time wasted and to take the boredom out of the kitchen. Manufacturers speed a constant flow of labor-saving domestic appliances, washing machines, refrigerators, and cookers with the built-in cordon bleu. The same firm manufactures electrical generating and distribution equipment on Merseyside. The industrial might of the area has earned a national and international reputation and provided a blueprint which has been taken up by many local authorities. To keep the wheels of industry turning, so to speak, uh, this firm of precision engineers has hundreds of skilled men who provide a tool-making service of the highest caliber. Designs for special tools, press tools, jigs, gauges, molds, the range is almost unlimited. Light engineering is today one of Liverpool's biggest industries and one of the most encouraging features of its development has been the remarkable assimilation of new mechanical skills by men from the region. The same adaptability to new skills has found spectacular growth in the chemical and pharmaceutical industries. From their research has sprung much progress in the development and production of antibiotics and specific drugs. High on the list of priorities comes the fight against influenza, and here eggs play a vital part in the production process. The results could have worldwide implications. But just as in medical progress, the birth of new industries calls for highly qualified men and women. This means new centres of learning and, of course, a vast expansion of Liverpool's own university. Modern tools like the digital computer serve the departments of the university. But computer time is also available to all those in industry who require it. Liverpool is a maritime centre, and where better than the university to build a great test tank or flume capable of simulating very high speeds, where the behaviour of ships' hulls, hydrofoils and hovercraft may be studied. By generating a wall of water travelling at a constant speed for the whole of its depth, the behaviour of a hull can be closely observed. Here, for example, a pre-war hull is tested at a speed equivalent to that produced by modern engines. Soon the critical point is reached and a sturdy merchantman takes on the characteristics of a submarine. Vast road and rail links built up over the years and branching out to every corner of the country are being developed still further to speed the products of these modern industries to their markets. Industrialists seeking room for their new factories find this network ready and waiting for them. And air links too. Liverpool Airport was built in 1933 as part of the city's revival plan. The city council has not been slow to assess the part air transport has to play in future growth and prosperity. 
the construction of a new runway designed to exacting international requirements with provision for even further extension is the first phase in an improvement scheme which also includes a new terminal building. With the advent of new industries, new trade has been brought to the docks. More and more of the world ships steam up and down the river, bringing in raw materials and carrying away the exports manufactured in the factories. Liverpool's 36 miles of quays handle 30 million tonnes of cargo a year. To meet the demand, further improvements are in hand and a port extension scheme is underway. Liverpool is fulfilling its heritage, its main artery, the Mersey. And all this resurgence is reflected in the city centre itself. New offices, banks and shops are springing up. There is confidence in the Mersey air. The future belongs to Liverpool and it is planning for that future on a massive scale. Here's another of the city's visionary schemes in the making, the complete replanning of its commercial heart. In this city of change, the best of the old is retained and the rest swept away to create air and space and make way for new and graceful buildings and a traffic system far in advance of most contemporary practice. This then is the Liverpool of today, thrusting forward into tomorrow. As virile, colourful and resilient as ever. A living community, the dynamo of the North West.